Good afternoon, everyone. This is Olivia Marquez with the NCCMT, and I'm a research coordinator for the Spotlight webinar series brought to you by the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. Thank you to those who have joined us this afternoon for our very special webinar, Spotlight webinar series presented by our scientific director, Dr. Maureen Dobbins, on the Rapid Review Guidebook. So we'll quickly review just a few housekeeping items before we get started today. Please see the chat section on the bottom right-hand side of your screen in WebEx. Please post any questions or comments that you might have during the webinar uh, there. We'll have a designated open Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to post any questions or comments that you have during the webinar, and we'll save those and answer those uh, at the end. Please post your comments in the chat section, and uh, please share your comments to all participants, as other participants might have the same question uh, as you as we move along. So today we recommend using a wired internet connection as opposed to wireless. And if you have any connection issues today, you can use the WebEx 24-7 helpline, which is posted in the slide um, and will also be posted in the chat section. We also have uh, two research assistants, Grace and Rowan, who will be available to assist with any technical issues that you have. So feel free to send a message um, through the chat section to them if you're having any issues. So after today, the PowerPoint presentation will be made available in English and French. And the English audio recording will also be made available on the NCCMT's website. So these resources can be accessed using uh, the link that will be shared in the chat section. And we'll have these posted within a week of the presentation from today. <clears throat> so we have our first polling question today. And we'd like to get a sense of uh, the audience that's joining us today. So we're wondering how many of you are watching today's session with you. So you can indicate if it's just yourself, um, or if you have one to three, four, five, six to ten, or over ten people with you. So just remember to select your response and then click Submit at the bottom. So thank you to those who are responding. We see most people are uh, joining themselves, um, and we have about five people who are joining with some other people in the room, so that's really great to see. Thank you to those who are responding. Um, so we'd like to officially welcome everyone to our NCCMT Spotlight on Methods and Tools webinar series. Um, we'll be posting the links to the registry page for this tool, and we'll also share all the links that we have uh, throughout the session today in the chat section. Um, today we will be hearing from uh, Maureen Dobbins, who's actually the author of the Rapid Review Guidebook and Scientific Director of the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the NCCMT, we're one of six national collaborating centers across Canada funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. We here at the NCCMT are located at McMaster University in Hamilton. While the other NCCs focus on the use of research evidence in specific uh, public health content areas, we here focus on improving uh, the access to and use of methods and tools for health professionals and practice within Canada. So we're not content specific, but we offer methods and tools that can be applied across different areas of public health. Uh, so the NCCMT has many products and services uh, available through our website. Uh, these are just a few of the products and services that we offer. So many of you uh, may be familiar with some of these already. And today we will be highlighting a tool that is located in our registry of methods and tools. And note that uh, the NCCMT also offers a variety of online learning opportunities through online learning modules. So we offer links to Public Health Plus and a variety of other multimedia tools for you to use. Um, so before we get started, um, we have our second polling question today, and we're wondering how many of you are familiar with the method or tool that we're discussing today, so this being the Rapid Review Guidebook. So you may not be familiar, uh, or you've heard of it, or you've actually used it yourself. Um, so again, just remember to select your response and hit Submit at the bottom of the screen. So thank you to those who are responding. It's really great to see we've had a few people who are not familiar um, with the method or tool, so it'll be great um, to share more information with you today, and a few people who have actually heard of the method or tool. 
um, and just one person who's actually used it themselves, which is really great to see. Um, and we'll just have our third polling question before we move along. Um, so we're wondering before we get started, um, how many of you find rapid reviews to be helpful in informing program planning decisions? So you may find them to be very helpful, uh, somewhat helpful, not at all, or you're not quite sure. So we'll leave that polling question open um, for just a little bit to allow people to respond. Um, so it's great to see that a few people who find them very helpful. Um, and we have about 20 people now who are saying that they don't know. So hopefully we can help give a little bit more information to those little individuals as well. So um, I'd like to formally introduce Dr. Maureen Dobbins, who's the author of the Rapid Review Guidebook and Scientific Director of the NCCMT. So thank you, Maureen, for joining us today. I'll pass the presentation along to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Olivia, and uh, thanks to Rowan and Grace for uh, all of the work you've done to bring this uh, webinar uh, to us today. And it's my pleasure to uh, be able to talk to you about the Rapid Review Guide. So thank you to everyone. I see there's quite a few uh, people who've joined us today and really uh, happy that you've taken this opportunity to learn a little bit more about this particular tool. Um, so just in terms of what our objectives are for uh, the day, I'm just going to talk a little bit about, you know, what is a rapid review? How is it different from other types of reviews? Uh, to go through the steps of a rapid review and uh, illustrate the many resources and tools that exist uh, at each step of the process that can really uh, help you if you find that you're in a position to be asked to do a rapid review. And then uh, we expect to have a fair amount of time for any questions uh, that you may have at, at, um, for the latter half of the webinar. So in terms of rapid reviews, I just have here what some of you may already be familiar with in terms of a published definition of a rapid review, but they're a form of knowledge synthesis. Uh, that uh, includes components of the systematic review process, but maybe uh, some parts may be simplified or may be omitted um, because the purpose is to, be out, is to be able to produce these more quickly than we would uh, a systematic review. So if anyone on the line has been involved in uh, a formal systematic review or meta-analysis and certainly a Cochrane uh, systematic review, you'll know that um, from the time that you identify a title to developing the protocol to completing all of the work of a systematic review, writing the report, getting that um, finalized or published, let's say on the Cochrane Library, that could take anywhere from two to three plus uh, years. Now, even if you're not doing it through the Cochrane approach, uh, it can still be a one to two year process uh, if you are going to um, comprehensively complete all of the steps in the review process. And uh, what we've learned over the years is uh, that type of a timeline really is not conducive to public health decision making. Uh, many of you, um, you know, you, you might need to act uh, and synthesize evidence. You might be given half a day's notice, one or two days notice. Sometimes you might have the luxury of uh, a few weeks to a few months, but really those are the timelines that we're talking about as opposed to uh, one to two years. And so, um, you know, what's really important about that is in, we, decisions need to be made then about how to speed up the process. And um, those decisions uh, may have important impacts on uh, how much trust you can put then in the findings of that review. And so what we've uh, certainly observed with the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools over the years is that more and more health units are becoming involved in doing these rapid reviews themselves. Uh, they've been engaging in, in uh, building their staff capacity to be able to do these reviews uh, because they need the answers to their practice-based questions in a more timely manner than it would take for a more formalized group to complete. And so um, we have many groups in Canada um, and in fact across the world who are becoming involved in doing rapid reviews. We have groups that are also 
uh, similar to NCCMT that are now talking about, well, what constitutes a good rapid review? What are some good methodologies for a rapid review? And in knowing that you you have to make decisions about what you can't or, or um, won't do, you need to be aware of what implications, what, what uh, implications that will have on the findings. So uh, first and foremost, it's, uh, they've really evolved uh, um, as a result of the timeliness, needing something more quickly. Uh, and in fact, anyone who's been involved in a, in a full-scale systematic review knows that it can actually be uh, a fairly, um, in addition to time, it can be a fairly resource-intensive endeavor, uh, depending on the uh, scope of your question and then the amount of search results and the number of uh, included studies. So again, a rapid review, uh, you make some decisions about what you will include that limit the scope that then reduce the amount of time as well as resources. Um, and other reasons why rapid reviews are done is that there maybe there has been a systematic review or meta-analysis. If you're lucky enough to find one that's been done on the exact topic that you need an answer to, maybe that uh, review was completed two or three years ago. And you know that there's been a number of single studies on that same topic that have been published since that review. And so this can be a way to augment what is already known in the literature uh, and seeing what's come out more recently than that review and then uh, doing a, a compare and contrast to what those new findings are saying to what would have been known previously in that, um, in that synthesized body of literature. So those are some of the reasons why rapid reviews have really, um, you know, found their place in the world of syntheses really over uh, the last, um, I mean, I'd say probably eight years or so, they've been, they've been becoming more known, but certainly within the last uh, two to four years, becoming um, much more uh, commonplace uh, in public health and many other areas of the healthcare system. So what I um, am going to do today is really just walk you through the, the rapid review guidebook is really um, progresses through a series of steps that really align with um, five of the seven steps of evidence-informed decision-making that, that we follow at the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. And I'm going to go through each step uh, with you, talk a little bit about what that step is about and also uh, show you the types of tools that we have that can help you with those steps. And um, you also will receive the uh, URLs to the tools that I'll be showing you if you want to uh, take a look at the actual live version of those uh, tools. Today we're just going to be showing you some screenshots uh, of the tools I'm going to um, be discussing. Um, but a rapid review really starts at, we call it step zero, um, which d d isn't even on our seventh step process, but that's that planning stage. So we need to really be thinking carefully about uh, what is the topic or the issue uh, that we want to address? What is our question? Who is it about? Um, what do we need to know? What are the issues? Who are the relevant stakeholders that need to be involved? And so, you know, this also brings in our learnings from the KT field, the knowledge translation field over the last two decades, that you know, if we want people to use the evidence, um, it's really uh, much more impactful to get them involved in helping us answer the questions from the very beginning and, in fact, helping us define what the questions are. So if you have a practice-based issue that you're faced with, that um, what the health unit may do, uh, it will impact other community stakeholders or multiple folks within one health unit, then it's a really good idea to assemble a team of these uh, stakeholders to help define the question, define the issues, uh, and really get a good sense of what it is you want to have an answer to at the end. Um, we certainly learned that having a project leader is really, really important. This can be uh, someone, maybe there's um, some of you that are on the, the call today, you have a specialized role, which is to synthesize the literature. Uh, and others, you may work in organizations that that uh, type of uh, role is, is uh, spread throughout multiple positions. 
um, and there isn't necessarily someone who has a key lead in that. What we have found is in order to move um, rapid reviews along uh, in a timely way, it's really, really helpful to have a defined project leader. And you might want to also identify what the various roles of folks uh, on that group will be. So will everyone be involved in all components of the rapid review? Will only some of you be doing the actual work of the rapid review, but others are there for consultation to ha have input into the topic or the question? or who might read early drafts of the report or help look at, um, uh, look at the findings and talk about implications. Uh, so it's really, really important to identify those roles and have your project leaders uh, at, who are also accountable to others in terms of the um, completion of the review and bringing the findings forward. Um, we want to define what the public health topic is. So of course we have, um, you know, public health has a very broad scope in, in Canada and around the world, so we want to understand what the public health topic is, and then we also want to take an opportunity before starting the rapid review to review the background literature so that we understand um, what is currently known about that topic. So, for example, uh, let's say um, your jurisdiction was um, wanting to explore uh, issues around uh, asthma, for example, in children, and wondering if there were any uh, environmental health types of interventions that uh, you could be thinking about or implementing, well, then it would be really important to be reviewing what do we currently know about childhood asthma, um, what are uh, some, do you have any local data, surveillance data that would indicate to you uh, the incidence or the prevalence, how often is this happening, is it getting worse, those types of things. And you'd want to pull all of that together into really a, a short paragraph, half a page to a page, um, as really your justification for then embarking on this rapid review. Um, I'm just going to cue uh, Olivia and Rowan and Grace. Um, while I've been talking, I haven't been uh, looking at all into chat to see if we have any questions uh, coming out. So if there's anything that you want me to stop and address, we can also do that. Just uh, let me know as we um, move along. I'm just opening up my chat too. Um, no so questions we'll posted so far, Maureen, but we'll let you know. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, now we're going to move on to step one, and so we, we uh, discussed this as that defined stage. And this is where we really need to do our hard work in really focusing in on what our question uh, is. And I can't ex uh, express enough the importance um, of this step. Um, and in that, uh, it's really, really important that um, all the stakeholders that are going to be involved really verbally talk about uh, what the question is. And um, our experience has been that it isn't until folks are, um, they don't have to necessarily be sitting around the table to have this discussion, but it isn't until there's active discussion that you start to realize that um, not everyone is thinking the same way about what uh, the target population might be or what the set of interventions or programs or services that you're interested in or the outcomes. Um, so really having this discussion will allow you to make sure everybody is on the same page, um, that you come to, um, if not consensus, agreement on uh, what it is you need uh, specifically answered as it relates to the populations, the uh, interventions or services, if it's a question around the effectiveness of an intervention or a program. And, uh, and for whom, so what, who the population is. Um, that can be different from uh, other kinds of questions. If you have, um, uh, what I was just describing there is what we would refer to as a PICO question, or you would use that acronym. The PICO is the population uh, intervention, um, what you're comparing that intervention to and your outcomes. So really, really important. Uh, the next acronym there, PECO, uh, well, that's for questions where um, you're, not, you're not perhaps yet interested in what effective interventions there are for a phenomenon, but rather 
uh, what are the relationships between, let's say, different um, environmental exposures and different kinds of outcomes? So here, if we come back to the asthma example, maybe our question is first understanding, um, uh, is there a relationship between uh, being exposed to certain types of environmental factors and uh, exacerbation of, of asthma, for example, or the uh, number of um, days hospitalized or hospital visits uh, for asthma. So if we have a question like that, that's what we refer to as uh, causation or association type of question, then we would use the PECO. And there again, the, the P, the C, the O is all the same, and the E, as we're substituting in E for exposure, different factors one could be exposed to as opposed to a specific intervention. And certainly as we think about the process of evidence-informed decision-making, all of these questions likely have uh, a place in our decision-making process in first understanding what factors uh, are associated with different types of health outcomes. And when we know those, and answer that through some synthesis of the literature, then does that make us ready to be able to look at, um, well, what can we do about those factors that leads us to looking at various types of interventions? If I just move on to PS, this is if we have a question that's a bit more on the, the qualitative side. So we, we need to understand um, the lived experience or the stories behind a certain phenomenon. And here we're interested in um, the population and the setting. So we want to, uh, if we wanted to understand um, how, uh, how different clients might respond to a type of intervention or a program uh, that we might have available in public health. And the, um, this is the kind of uh, question and the, this is the, the PS is what we would use to help us define what it is we're trying to answer. So all of these are really important um, uh, activities to do prior to uh, going in and starting to search for the literature. So we, we really uh, um, label that as that defined stage. And then in the final uh, piece we see here, we see progress plus the determinants of health framing. So very, very important. Um, and particularly uh, picking up steam now in public health over the last few years is really trying to ensure that our public health programs are not widening uh, the gap with respect to inequalities. And so we want to make sure that our, the questions that we're posing um, really take into account or consideration factors related to the determinants of health. Uh, and so uh, a tool that I'll show you in a few moments is called Progress Plus. And this, um, you know, are reminders to us about the different factors. And we might want to build that in into defining our question, which then will go into um, it being incorporated into our search strategy, which will then allow us to find literature that brings in uh, these components relevant to the determinants of health. Um, and I would just you know, add there to the extent that that evidence is available. And in some areas we do have, uh, there is a growing body of evidence that is um, uh, relevant and, and, and gives us uh, good knowledge about uh, impacts of the determinants of health. And in other areas there might, it, it might be um, less prominent in its availability, but at least we can incorporate that from the very beginning into our searches. Um, I see here a quick question, and, and I think I might take the opportunity to, um, to uh, speak to it. So uh, someone had asked, will I speak to the difference between a scoping review and a rapid review? And are there types of questions where rapid review is not uh, recommended? So if I just um, go back to the first one, a scoping review, uh, and great questions, by the way. So a scoping review is something that we might want to do uh, very early on uh, with a body of literature. Uh, many times we will do a scoping review to, uh, basically a scoping review is going to give us the lay of the land. What exists in the literature on this topic? So maybe we haven't looked too much at a topic previously and we really don't know what's there. We don't know um, 
if there has, has been much done with respect to evaluating the effectiveness of interventions. Uh, we don't know if there's been much done um, that assesses the association um, between um, factors. Uh, we might not be aware if there's been much done to really explore how people feel and think uh, about a particular phenomenon. So we use the scoping review to, um, to go in to take a look at the literature and then based on what we find from that, then we can move on to say, okay, there's actually been a lot done here and um, there may be um, multiple systematic reviews that could be done, for example, um, on different kinds of interventions. Um, we could see that there's a fair amount of literature that looks at relationships between factors that would be good to synthesize uh, prior to perhaps doing a systematic review of interventions. So that scoping review really would be an umbrella, if we, uh, so to speak, to go out and find all of what's there and categorize it, classify it. What, what, of, what part of the evidence is about um, evaluating interventions? What parts are telling us maybe about incidence and prevalence and how, how often is this phenomenon occurring? Other evidence might be telling us what, what are important factors that are associated with this phenomenon. So that's really what we can get out of a systematic review, uh, out of a scoping review, and from there we can make some decisions about where to next. Um, you know, uh, we might find out that really there's been very, very little done with respect to evaluating interventions. And so it might not be, um, you know, might not be uh, at that point a good time to uh, uh, do a systematic review, for example. So the difference between, um, I, I really think of a, a scoping review as something really quite different from a rapid review. A rapid review here we can be thinking about here in answering probably a much more defined uh, question and likely um, the end goal is not to know what exists in the literature but to be asked, answering a very specific question related to that literature. For example, the effectiveness of an intervention or program or some other type of a, of a question. Um, are there types of questions where rapid reviews are not recommended? I, I mean, I think that's a bit more of a judgment uh, call. Um, some of you may know that I, I've uh, been involved with uh, Cochrane um, pretty much since the beginning, so for a very, very long time. And I would, you know, I would think if, if we have the luxury and the resources to do uh, a very comprehensive systematic review and or meta-analyses, we would want to do that. Um, barring not having the luxury of the time and the resources, um, then that's when we will default to a rapid review. So I guess um, I don't necessarily think uh, an answer to this question is to say there's certain topics that lend themselves better to rapid reviews, but rather it comes back to the, the concepts I raised earlier that really come back to how quickly do you need an answer? Is there already an answer out there? Um, what kinds of resources and expertise do you have um, really to guide uh, your, uh, guide an answer around in which instances would you do a rapid review versus something much more uh, involved? Um, and I'm going to save um, the, that question on what are the risks to making decisions based on rapid reviews versus systematic reviews. And I'm just going to ask um, my support staff to make sure I don't forget that question later on because that is definitely an excellent question. And uh, I want to go through some of the steps. And I think as we go through some of the steps, some of those risks um, about you know our trade-offs of what we're making decisions of not to do, how that might impact uh, the results and, and um, how cautious we need to be with those results. I think we can um, have a really good discussion uh, closer to the end of the webinar, but thank you for posting that. So um, I'm just going to show you a couple of tools here, uh, and this one is called the Health Evidence Tool for Developing a Question. And uh, so this is a tool that you can actually 
download um, and then upload to to um, your desktops, and it just really walks you through that process. If you were uh, defining uh, a PICO question or a PECO question or a uh, um, more qualitative question, this this cues you to the different things to be thinking about as you uh, go through defining and refining each of those components. And then it, it has a space for you to actually be filling in the blanks yourself. Uh, one of the things that I'll say many, many times throughout the webinar is it's really, really, really important to document um, your steps as you go through this and to have those electronic copies of what you've done. So from the very beginning, um, if you start from the very beginning, you're not going back afterwards. Maybe it's a month later, two months later, maybe it's four months later, six months later, and you're trying to remember what you did. Um, if your memory is like mine, then that would be an impossible task. Um, so right from the very beginning, this isn't something that would take you a long time to do. Start writing in those words as, as they come to you and as you refine it. And you would also find that um, uh, you might end up with um, multiple iterations while you refine and refine and refine your question. And so this tool is something that's very hands-on. You can then save it. Um, um, one of the things we talk a lot about is organizations developing information management systems, like you would want to have a place on your server, on your intranet, where this type of work um, can be saved and managed, all the files managed, so that other people can actually go in and take a look at this. One thing we um, hear so often as we interact with public health departments is um, uh, unfortunately, sometimes health units have multiple teams working on very similar questions, but they don't know that they are because there, there isn't a central repository um, that they could go look at to see, well, has someone already asked this question? Maybe in a slightly different way, but we could use that knowledge um, now. So keeping track and filling all of this out and finding a way to manage the files is something that can be really useful. So this tool is just kind of that hands-on and it gives you a few suggestions um, also around what are called mesh headings because ultimately um, the, the, this task, this step not only helps you define your question, it helps you to start developing the search terms that you will use or your librarian will use um, uh, when you go into those electronic databases to start looking for the evidence. So there's a few uh, tips at the bottom around um, mesh headings, which is um, 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 medical uh, subject heading um, headings that you can use for searching, some tips um, around that. So all of these tools are really just to help make this process as easy as possible um, for you. What I've now uh, have you looking at is that one step further in terms of bringing that equity lens to all of your questions. So Progress Plus which was created by the Cochrane Methods Equity Group. Um, and the link is, um, uh, it's been included in the chat, but it's also at the bottom of the PowerPoint here. And this just helps you to think about those other things that most likely are in the back of your mind, brings it to the forefront to not forget about. So place of residence, things like race, ethnicity, culture, language, occupation, gender, sex, religion, education, uh, SES, social capital, and likely in reading these, it'll, it'll tweak you to think of others that maybe aren't on this list as well. So any of those uh, char uh, characteristics or factors um, that may have an impact on one's uh, uh, health outcomes and or other outcomes, that could, should and could really be a part of um, part of that search for the evidence. Uh, you want to be thinking about that, and this is a tool that will, uh, at a minimum, you know, make sure that you haven't forgot about some of those things that, you know, even um, given that this is something that is trying to be accomplished a little bit more quickly than perhaps some of the other things we work on, it might be really easy to forget really important factors. So just a tool that um, you might want to um, keep in mind and take a look at. 
So if we move on now to step two, we call this the search, search and relevance. So there's really a couple of things going on here. We want to be using our time most efficiently and effectively to quickly find the evidence that is related to our question. As well, if possible, if we can go to places that have already appraised the quality of that evidence for us, even better, that'll help um, in the next step really reduce that. So we want to make sure that we're using our time efficiently and effectively. We want to know that we're going to search for information. If we can find synthesized evidence first, as opposed to looking for multiple single studies, then that can cut out um, and save us some time, cut some steps out for us. So our search is all around that efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, the 6S pyramid, I'll show you in a moment, is, is where we're really thinking about trying to go to those sources that have synthesized evidence first. We want to know and document where have we searched and what kinds of results did we get, so how successful was it to go to certain places. We want to save our search strategies. Um, I don't know if anyone is like me, but um, and searching, I have to admit, isn't my most favorite thing to do in the world. But when I am in databases searching um, and working away, I'm constantly tweaking the search strategy. And then I'm so happy when I found um, a result set that appears relevant. Uh, I sometimes get out of the whole thing way too quickly and I've completely forgotten what my search strategy was and I forgot to save it. And now I can't remember what I did because um, I changed too many things along the way. So we want to make sure that we save our searches, we save the iterations of our searches and know where we ended up at the end. And we want to do that for a couple of different reasons. At you know, if we jump ahead to the end and you've now uh, written a report and let's say you're uh, presenting to senior management, um, and someone wants to know where you went. So, so tell me where you found the evidence. Where, where did you go? Or did you go here or did you go there? You want to be able to know right away exactly in a couple of sentences, we did this, we did this, we did that. Um, and even better if you're able to tell them then when we went here, we found this. When we went here, we didn't find much. Those kinds of answers is what you want to quickly have at your fingertips. So the best time to keep track of all of that is right when you're doing it. Um, so saving those search strategies. And the second reason is, you know, EI, evidence informed decision making is a very iterative process. And, um, you know, you might find yourself or maybe your colleague will find themselves having to revisit this issue and the literature down the road. Um, and if you already have documented what you did and what your search strategy was, then the next person or yourself could be picking up right from that work having already been done. If you haven't actually saved uh, your searches, then, uh, and you have to come back and look at it again in the future, um, then if without knowing uh, what you did, you can't just pick up from where you left off before you might have to go back and do it all again. And I, I sadly speak from uh, experience when uh, years ago colleagues and I were working on systematic reviews evaluating public health interventions. We didn't save um, our searches back then, found ourselves updating some of those reviews a few years later, and without knowing what the search strategy was, we really had to start all over again and redevelop them. So trying to just save you a little bit of heartache and not having to do that. Um, you want to download those results you're getting out of searches to preferably some type of a reference manager management software. So um, this is this can really save so much time in terms of that process of what happens next um, and being able to uh, download those results into um, a type of software that is specifically set up to handle references and, and allow you to do that work of looking through things is really, really important. You need to know um, very early uh, what, of, um, what articles of what you find are going to be included and which ones are going to be excluded. So you really want to develop um, very explicit, written down, um, you know, to be included in our rapid review, a, a, an article needs to meet these criteria. 
um, and it needs to meet all of them in order to be included. Uh, and it's, uh, we're going to ex exclude those that have the following. So that's very, very important that that all be written down um, and adhered to. You might need to make some tweaks along the way, but really you want to have that all uh, done ahead of time. And then you want to keep track of why you excluded things. So um, perhaps it was because there wasn't data provided for a certain um, population. Uh, and if that wasn't included, even though it was a relevant intervention, um, then you want to be able to document that's why a particular study didn't end up being included. So around that, this is what is involved in that step two of search and, and relevance. And I'm just going to uh, quickly here take you through a few things that can help you. So on, um, when we talk about the 6S pyramid, and this can be accessed, information about this can be accessed uh, through the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools website. Just talks a little bit more about the 6S pyramid and what other types of resources um, are available there to uh, help you. And we've created a tool online that at all of these levels of evidence, um, what types of sources exist in the world, and mostly those that are freely available that house content relevant for public health. Um, so if you were to uh, click on the, uh, the left-hand side of your screen here where it says click here to access a search pyramid of general public health topics, that would take you to a page on our site with this success pyramid with the different sources of evidence at the different um, levels. And if we just talk a little bit more about the levels of evidence, so um, the 6S pyramid, which we are continuing to adhere to at the National Clarifying Center, talks about um, that we have different levels of evidence that are defined by the degree to which the evidence has been synthesized. So we really want to start at the top of the pyramid um, and only uh, proceed to lower levels of the pyramid looking for evidence if we don't find um, what, we're, what we need at the higher levels. So you would only find yourself looking in the large electronic databases that are primarily filled with single studies if you haven't found um, what you're looking for or what you need at higher uh, levels of the pyramid. And just really quickly, you know, systems uh, is something that integrates both uh, the literature as well as um, uh, knowledge about uh, characteristics of, um, in this case, it could be a jurisdiction. Um, we've seen it used in acute care where it takes uh, patient uh, characteristics and, and um, biological, physiological uh, information about a particular patient and it melds that with uh, the best available research evidence and brings that all together behind the scenes to give you, let's say, recommendations to be considering for that particular uh, patient. Um, I'm happy to say that up until recently, we've, we've mostly said that there really aren't systems like this at the public health level, um, but I am really uh, happy to say that uh, certainly with um, researchers like Dr. David Buckridge at McGill University, um, this is, there's definitely work ongoing in, in Canada now that is trying to create a system like this that will bring together local um, surveillance type data and meld it with um, like a repository of reviews like uh, health evidence and bring this together for a user to then come up with um, what, what might be some possible uh, interventions or programs based on community characteristics. Um, still very, very early days, but really, really exciting uh, to see these types of um, initiatives uh, happening in Canada. So those are systems. Summaries are uh, really another word for best practice guidelines, and there are a number of organizations around the world that are creating uh, those and, and compiling them into repositories, uh, and that include uh, topics relevant for public health. Um, we have many that are involved in writing synopses of syntheses. So syntheses are like our systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and a synopsis would be a short, let's say, abstract or uh, one-pager about um, what that review is about and its findings. Then we move down to syntheses, so various, uh, many groups around the world involved in um, 
all sorts of uh, syntheses, and this is likely where our rapid reviews would end up being compiled as well. Synopses of, sing of single studies, and then our single studies. So this is really just a, a framework of thinking about levels of synthesized evidence. And uh, this tool, which is tra tracking your search results tool, is another tool that you can download um, from Health Evidence, upload into your own system, and then, um, and then add your relevant information to it. And so um, uh, we've actually just, uh, just this week finalized a revised, um, updated version of this tool. It will probably be uploaded to Health Evidence in the next few weeks. Um, and again, it's highlighting at all the different levels uh, of evidence on the pyramid, relevant sources around the world uh, that you can access that have public health evidence, whether they're freely available or not, and whether they critically appraise the evidence. Um, and what this asks you to do on the final two columns is to document you know, what, what kind of results did you get when you went there. And this is also important because it'll help help you think um, as more of these are done in your organization, there might be sources out there that are, uh, you know, consistently have evidence that are relevant for public health and for certain topics, and maybe other ones are less so. And so eventually you might use that knowledge to really um, refine where you're going to go first to look for the evidence. And then uh, the last column is where you can embed a link to that saved search strategy. So again, just something that can um, uh, you know, help you keep track of where you've been and what kinds of results that you're getting. This one and we, you know, the, is a flow chart of our search and results. Really, really important um, to be able to answer questions around where did you go, what kind of results did you get, and how did you end up with that final set of studies that you included. So this flow chart, again, you can download this and you can tweak it to um, match uh, what you do specifically for your review. But just as an example here, um, you can see, you, you know, and of course, very, very important, we want to date things, probably want to title this with whatever the topic is. But we can identify here um, what we return from our searches at all those levels on the pyramid. We can identify the total number of articles that were uh, accessed. Of course, um, we usually will end up with some amount of duplicates. You want to remove those. Then we want to do some preliminary assessment. This might be just done with the title um, uh, of, the, of the article. And um, oftentimes, um, we can tell from just the title if it seems like it's possibly relevant, and we can get rid of very quickly all of those that are very obviously not. So this flowchart just really helps you keep track of how you end up at the very bottom here, um, how many ended up being included, and it'll also allow you to document the quality once you've done the methodological quality, which is in the next step. And then finally, um, if, uh, if you're really interested, um, within our uh, online learning module, our suite of online learning modules at NCCMT, we do have a specific module on searching. Uh, this module will take anywhere from probably two to four hours to complete, uh, and it'll walk you through um, uh, this, you know, the search uh, process. It'll have you practice searching um, and developing terms and uh, documenting terms, things like that. So um, if this is uh, uh, an area of your position that um, you require some knowledge and skill and expertise in, then this, is, uh, this might be a really useful tool to have. There's a pre-post knowledge test, and you can also, um, if you receive a, on the post knowledge test, a score of 75% or higher, you can then uh, print off a, a, a certificate of competence that may be useful for professional development or a career review, those types of things. So just another resource that's uh, available to you. Um, I'm just going to move forward, and again, I'm going to come back to questions uh, closer to the end. So now we want to move on to critical appraisal. So really, really important 
um, that we know what the quality is of the uh, evidence that we're using. And actually, I'm just going to stop myself um, before I talk too much about this and go back to searching for a moment. One of the things I didn't talk about is, you know, within a rapid review, we do may need to make decisions at every time point, at every step, um, about how we're going to save time if, if time really is of the essence, um, which is why you're doing the rapid review. So, for example, you might make decisions about um, only looking in one database or only uh, going back a certain number of years. So you might just search back three years or five years. Um, you might make a decision to only look at best practice guidelines, or you might make a decision to only look at uh, systematic reviews or to only um, um, uh, look, you might not look at many different languages and languages can um, impact our results in terms of where research results are being published, those kinds of things. And so those are the kinds of decisions that you need to make that are based on uh, the amount of time and with an, um, anticipating the amount of results that you're going to get, um, then that will inform some of those decisions that you make. And then again, very, very important that you um, document what the decisions were um, and, and even some thinking about what impact that might have had uh, on your results. So now I'm gonna jump back to the critical appraisal. So, Regardless of the level of evidence that you're looking at, you're going to want to um, either uh, use someone else's rating if, you, if it's trustworthy and credible, or do your own critical appraisal. And therefore, um, uh, um, you need to be aware of the different kinds of tools uh, that are out there to help you or resources that exist. Uh, um, because there's many, many that are out there. You don't need to be uh, on your own in this activity. So first you need to know, uh, you know, what is the level of evidence that you're looking at? Are you going to have best practice guidelines or are you looking at systematic reviews or single studies? Uh, depending on what you have in your rapid review, and you might have multiple levels of evidence in your review depending on your question and, and your decision. Um, once you know that, if that evidence hasn't already been critically appraised for you, then you need to pick appropriate tools. So with a best practice guideline, um, you would look at the agree to tool. If it's a systematic review, there's a variety of different types of tools that are out there. I'll show you a few in a moment. And <clears throat> excuse me, and if um, you feel like you need a bit more um, training, then there's um, multiple um, modules, online learning modules, uh, that you could access to do some training prior to starting this work. And then the last piece that I'll talk about here is, uh, you know, one of the things that I guess I, I um, would encourage quite, uh, quite a bit for the rapid review process is to use two people to rate the articles for quality. Um, and I say this later as well also in data extraction. If there's an area where I guess I feel strongly you probably don't want to minimize is uh, with respect to rigor, it would be on having more than one person independently rate the articles for um, all aspects, inclusion, quality, and the data that you extract. So if we just move on here, I'm just gonna quickly show you um, that all of these uh, tools um, can be accessed through the Registry of Methods and Tools, which would then take you to their, their home institutions. Um, so the Agree To tool is the latest um, version that helps you assess the quality of a best practice guideline. And uh, there's um, multiple ways in which you can complete that assessment. You can download the Agree To tool, print it, and do the assessments in hard copy but you can also, you could do it electronically, um, and you can also create a profile with Agree, and it will store your assessments, your critical appraisals of those best practice guidelines in your profile if you wanted to go back um, and look at that. So really important um, to do that, and again, that's something that you would wanna do with multiple people. Um, one of the tools 
that you can use to appraise the quality of a systematic review if you found one that uh, isn't already in health evidence um, is the healthevidence.org tool, uh, which looks at a series of 10 questions uh, to rate systematic reviews. Um, but there's also the AMSTAR tool, which uh, is a newly revised tool, um, has a couple of different questions and generally they're somewhat similar to the health evidence tool, a few different questions. Um, we've separated out a few questions uh, to try to make it, a, I find it some, sometimes a little bit easier for folks for the type of literature we have in public health, but really um, this is also a very, very good tool and probably the most um, uh, known worldwide, uh, probably internationally accepted uh, tool. And uh, one other group um, in the UK that has many tools and again, fairly um, easy to use is the, they're called the CASP tools and there's one uh, specifically for systematic reviews. So again, all of these tools um, can be downloaded. Uh, again, you'd want to create a information management system that would allow you to keep track of completing these assessments and compiling them somewhere uh, so that if you needed to go back in and look at them at a future date, you would um, be able to find them all. And then if we were actually um, at the level of single studies, as I uh, indicated just a moment ago, CAST has a wide variety of tools um, that you could access here for many different types of uh, single studies and research designs. So for randomized control trials, for economic evaluations, case control, qualitative cohort studies. So they have a, 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 a great variety here as well as tutorials to help you with that. So step four here, now we want to move into uh, synthesis. And this, I guess, this will involve both um, extracting data, summarizing our results, and formalizing our conclusions. So one of the things that's really important here is we need to decide as well, really ahead of time, what data are we going to be pulling out of this evidence, right, out of every article. So we, we don't want to wait until we go in and see what's there and pick out only certain kinds of outcomes or information. We want to decide up front, you know, what do we need pulled out in order to answer our question comprehensively? And then um, we uh, um, develop a tool that will guide us in that and then we consistently uh, extract that data as we go. Now again, here we might need to make some uh, decisions around um, how much data are we going to pull out, those kinds of things, um, but we just want to be very clear you make those decisions uh, ahead of time. And, and the same, I guess, if I go back to the critical appraisal step, I, I'm certainly aware of some uh, organizations um, that are involved in doing rapid reviews. Um, some will always critically appraise the evidence and they'll find shortcuts elsewhere. Others don't do the critical appraisal. Um, and so that, again, is a decision point. Um, I guess if you want my opinion, I would say critical appraisal is an absolute must in the process. Um, but again, those are the kinds of decision points that one faces in a rapid review. As we move forward, I, what I've given you here is just an example of a review, um, a, the data extraction form of a review uh, that I've worked on in the past. And this just is, you know, it gives you an example of um, a column for participants. You want to know um, the author and year the paper was published what was the methodological quality rating from the critical appraisal, some description of the interventions, how were the outcomes measured, um, how many, um, how long did the study go for, what kind of design, what were the results, are there any differences by subpopulation. So just really just an example that one could work from. You really need to tailor it to the specific question that you have for that review. What we also want to do here is this is a, 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 a supporting tool that can really uh, make sure that in looking at the evidence, we're thinking about the determinants of health again. 
So we really, it helps, it prompts us to think about, to look for um, if there's differences by groups or settings that are reported in the data, um, if there are differences in baseline set, uh, conditions that across groups that may explain some findings. Um, we, so th this is a really nice tool that can really, uh, um, you know, remind us to not forget about some of these uh, um, different um, uh, factors that may impact outcomes and results uh, that we might want to be looking for. So, uh, and, and it could very well be that when the, the studies that you're looking at or the articles you're looking at do not address these factors, then you need to document that that's not there because maybe there's additional evidence, sources of evidence, information that you'll need to access to help um, fill in those gaps. So um, uh, another tool that we think can really help bring in that equity perspective. And then um, also as part of formalizing conclusions and really summarizing that data, a briefing note, here's an example that could be used um, that can, you can access from um, health evidence again. But again, this tries to bring everything into one short document. Um, what the what the topic is about, what the issues were, some background information, what the current status uh, is of the issue, any local data, um, and then it really um, gets you to really identify the key findings and implications. So this could be something that um, you know, some might use at the end after the report is already, a more fulsome report is already done to really focus in on what are those key issues if you wanted to put something in one to two pages, let's say, to, um, to senior management, for example. So I just have a few more slides and then I'm gonna go right back to uh, all the questions that I see. So again, um, we might want to think about that uh, incorporating an equity perspective. And so here's a tool from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care about conducting a health equity impact assessment. Again, really, really important to help us think about, you know, what, what, uh, what impact might different types of programs have on different um, populations and subpopulations. So again, something that can help us work through that process. And then we talk about here step five, which is applicability and transferability. So um, much of the uh, literature or the evidence base that exists, um, relatively little of it uh, has been generated here in Canada. Um, but there's a great deal of evidence that is produced around the world. And we likely want, don't want to be throwing all of that away because it's not been created in Canada, but rather um, you know, make some assumptions that it likely uh, has some place in Canada, and then we need to think about whether or not it really is applicable, whether we can um, transfer it to our local uh, jurisdictions, and then what types of uh, modifications we may need to make to certain programs in order to make them more applicable and feasible and transferable um, to our situation here in Canada. And so um, that's what this stage is really all about. You might, you're going to want to um, reassemble your group of stakeholders to look at, look at the findings of the review, share that report, have good discussions around uh, what makes sense, what's feasible, um, within the uh, resources and the needs and the experience and expertise uh, of that local area and, um, and then to come to some uh, decisions and conclusions around that. And so here, just uh, pointing out here um, a tool that we refer to as the A&T tool, so the applicability and transferability tool. There's actually two versions of this tool um, that basically take you through specific questions uh, that you would want to be asking if you were going to uh, start something new. So let's say be adding new programming or adding new interventions. Um, that could be adding it to something that already exists or starting something brand new. 
Um, so a series of questions it takes you through um, and you can document answers to. And then there's a slightly revised version of the tool if you, um, if, if a decision was looking like it was stopping doing something that let's say uh, the health unit or the organization has been doing um, for a period of time. So what are the things that you would make, need to take into consideration? Who all needs to be involved? Those kinds of things that take you through that. So that's one version of that tool. And um, it's, the tool has also been uh, taken a step further to again, uh, ask these questions from an equity perspective. And this is referred to as the Knowledge Translation Toolkit. And it really takes us through not just that same series of um, questions in the, in the previous tool, but now putting the, that lens of different factors around the determinants of health as part of that process as well. So that can, um, again, make sure that we're not forgetting about that very, very important step. Um, perhaps before we might have gotten to um, discussing that a and we might want to write up that report. And everyone here might be a little bit different in terms of what the expectations are from their organization. Um, some health units um, clearly articulate that they expect uh, a multi-paged report with appendices and things like that uh, to be produced and they're um, filing those, uh, you know, they're keeping those um, available through their intranet, some even maybe post to their website that others could access. So some, some really are at that level of a, of a formal report, although, uh, although um, uh, likely not at that level of um, publishing, like you're not trying to, um, this isn't a research project that you're trying to get published, although to some extent, it's really, really important that with this, all this work being done, we find ways for health units to be able to share this knowledge uh, amongst themselves in terms of making them accessible. Some of you might have a very formal um, process or expectation of a report, and others, really, it's about the findings and being able to document those. So I guess the most important thing is here is likely uh, knowing what the expectation is, likely knowing um, you know, what, what, uh, what any kind of write-up or being able to report back to others on, on what was done, what's required of you. This is a, an example or a suggestion that I have. You might want to have a key messages, start with the key messages. That, that would be no more than a page, an executive summary that would include a little bit about what you did and then um, what the findings were, what the implications are, um, full report. Um, some have said like up to 20 pages. Um, that could include your um, things like your data extraction tools, things like that. As I indicated earlier, you might need to revisit, unlikely need to revisit um, the topic um, in the future. We know, for example, right now in chronic diseases, if you're working in diabetes or uh, physical activity, obesity, um, many, many areas in chronic diseases, we're talking about you know, thousands of studies being published every year, hundreds of reviews being published every year, um, things like that. So there's much new knowledge, new knowledge coming out all the time that might require us to periodically be going back in and taking a look at what we've done, which also makes it really important for it to be documented what you did so that um, if you do go back, you can pick up where you left off instead of having to start basically over again. Uh, and then again, just for um, helping support um, knowledge movement throughout an organization, one within, within an organization, a health unit or other community organization, and then across the sector, you know, how do we make this information freely available to others so that one, we can um, reduce duplication of uh, multiple health units working on uh, a very similar rapid review at the exact same time as we know to be the case. Um, we um, have come across that in our discussions with public health. Um, and two, to be able to share that knowledge because if we're talking about just that review of the evidence um, before you customize it to the needs of your own jurisdiction, that review of the evidence can be very, very helpful um, to other, other uh, health units, other organizations. 
In terms of sections for that final report, again, you want to talk about the public health topic, what we currently know about it. Um, you know, if there's programs or policies currently in place, what do we know about those? We want to talk about the synthesis of the findings, what the implications are for the organization, and then our references and different kinds of appendices that we might uh, include in that report. So um, actually, why don't we just back up before we go to that? And um, uh, that's all. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Olivia. Hi, Maureen. So um, I've just actually collected um, all of the questions because we had a few questions posted throughout. So thank you to all the participants um, for really great questions. And I've just sent them to you, Maureen. So a few of them we have actually um, gone over um, uh, since the question has been posted. Um, but a few of them we can actually uh, probably still review now, if that's okay. I can, um, not sure if you wanted to pick out some of them, Maureen, or if I can read some of them uh, to you, if that's more helpful. So I see them all, um, Olivia, so I'll, why don't I, I'll start at the top and just go through. So, um, and thank you everyone for listening to me ramble on for so long. I hope some of that was, um, was helpful. So the first question here, what are the risks to making decisions based on rapid reviews versus um, systematic reviews? And um, I suppose this is where I wish all of us were sitting in a room right now, and I'd really like to hear your thoughts um, on that as well, because uh, you know, you're, you're, the, you're the decision makers and um, you know, are in these positions of needing to make uh, decisions when the evidence isn't always readily at hand. Some of the risks are, um, uh, you know, in, in making decisions about um, not doing all of the components uh, of a systematic review or not doing them as comprehensively as a systematic review means that we might miss some important information or we might make some decisions that kind of lead us towards a certain kind of answer, although we may not be explicitly trying to just go to a certain answer, but it might lead us there. So, for example, um, if, if we uh, only um, look at very, very recent uh, literature, so we limited our search to just a few years, it could be that there were some really important uh, studies or a review of multiple studies uh, that that was released um, just before our date that um, may have a different finding than what we're finding now. So we could be missing that knowledge and maybe there's something different about the studies that are coming out now um, that uh, may explain, let's say, a difference um, in the outcomes. So, you know, decisions that we make about where we're going to search, how far we're going to search, like how far we will go in our search, may uh, impact um, the direction of the results that we end up seeing in what, in what we end up having in our review. And it might mean that you don't have the whole picture. Um, and without having the whole picture, you know, maybe, maybe what you're finding right now are things that suggest an intervention is more effective than it really is. So that could be the risk, that we are um, being overly, we end up being overly positive that an intervention works when in fact it doesn't. Or um, maybe some newer studies have recently come out that are suggesting an intervention is not effective, but the full body of literature, when you look at the, the literature in its entirety, overall tells us that it actually um, is effective. So those are the kinds of issues that can happen um, in terms of what happens with our results when we, when we can't assure ourselves that we have found everything that's uh, out there. Another example might be if one were to uh, not critically appraise the evidence um, and just uh, use all your evidence has been created equal. And so we, we really, are, uh, if we didn't concern ourselves with knowing this result came from a really methodologically strong uh, study or review or best practice guideline, and, and we just added that to the results of something, another um, 
uh, piece of evidence that wasn't very well done, um, then, you know, that can, again, lead us down um, a path of, you know, maybe we're, we're being influenced by not the highest quality uh, evidence. So, again, those are just those kinds of examples. Those are the kinds of risks that are there when we do a rapid review. Um, you know, I, I think we need to just keep in mind there that, um, you know, as decision makers, you're trying to do the best that you can with what you have available at the time. Um, and so if you're in that position where you need to make a decision relatively soon and there is nothing that's more synthesized, like let's say at that systematic review level, then turning to this idea of a rapid review is, um, we would, you know, hope be more helpful than not doing that and then, um, let's say, picking just a study uh, to, be, to help inform that um, decision. Um, what about evidence briefing? And so I, um, um, I, I need to make a few assumptions, but I think we're, we're thinking there about where we do a quick look, like an evidence brief. So where we do a very quick look at the evidence and, and then write some assumptions. And so again here, um, same kinds of risks that we have uh, that I was just talking about. So in doing an evidence brief, you're making decisions about what you're going to include and what you're not going to include and by how long you have to create that brief um, and whether or not you are uh, using the best quality evidence or weighting the best quality evidence, um, though all of those kinds of things. So evidence briefs can certainly, um, you know, an evidence brief that would be based on a comprehensive best practice guideline or a systematic review or systematic reviews in a topic area is going to be different, a different kind of product um, uh, than if you um, have a clean slate and one goes and finds um, different kinds of evidence to uh, populate an evidence brief with. Um, so I gave you an example of what you might do with one form of an, of an evidence brief, but I think that one is a little bit different from some of the briefs that I've seen um, that, let's say, might be used in policy. So again, though, it's just really trying to understand if we only pick a handful of studies uh, and we have no idea what else is out there, then is that handful somehow biased in leading us down a certain um, path, and those are the risks. Um, of those. If I just move on, um, for search strategy building, do you start from scratch or do you try to use templates from previous relevant studies? So excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, certainly in defining your question, you, you, you start building those words that are going, going to form your search strategy. So I think it's really important to start with really understanding what your question is. And then I really uh, usually refer to it as, you know, the art and science of searching, that accordion where um, you're going to want to go and now take a look um, with, with your question clearly defined and the, in, the initial um, search words that come out of that question, you know, um, if it's yourself or if you're lucky enough to have the services of a librarian running some searches, see what you get back. And when you start finding articles that are relevant to that topic, then certainly going into those articles and taking a look at um, what kinds of keywords were those articles have been, um, what kind of terms those articles have been keyworded with can be very, very helpful. And then there are also other types of resources that can help you. Um, there's been a, a fair amount of work that's been done to create what are called filters or search filters or hedges, uh, where some really, really creative folks have gone in and they've um, um, put all the words together to find um, all the studies, let's say for a type of design. So if you want to find RCTs, this is the, the string of search words that you need that's going to help find systematic reviews in a particular search and then from there you can identify the ones that are relevant for your topic or add that topic in. So for designs 
there are many of these types of filters uh, that have been created that can help you focus in. So certainly um, using, using those, uh, once you find relevant articles, uh, building on those keywords, and then it's that back and forth until you are really, really confident that your search term is finding what you need and reducing how much you don't need, then, you know, you practice your search on, you know, go back a year or go back two years. But if your plan was to search 10 years, you don't do that until you know you have that final, final uh, search strategy figured out. Um, so the next question, will you at some point in the presentation talk about what components of a systematic review are modified or omitted in the rapid review? So I think we've, um, we've talked about that. Um, so in the next question, although systematic reviews are considered high quality evidence, how do we interpret a systematic review that has a poor quality rating? Yes, um, de definitely not, that, that's an issue that we need to be aware of. And really there's, there's actually at least two different um, issues uh, to discuss there. So one of them is we could have a systematic review that has been done very poorly. Um, and there are many of those. There are, there are many that are like that. Um, and we definitely should be cautious and worried about uh, whether or not those, we can trust those results because of all of the issues that I uh, just, just discussed about um, with rapid reviews. So that uh, um, if a systematic review has not done very, a very good job of finding all of the evidence then maybe the search strategy is biased towards mostly finding studies that show a positive effect. Well, um, you know, what's missing there is if there's just as many studies that exist that show that intervention didn't have an effect, then maybe we would, you know, really make a dif different decision about that intervention if we knew that. Um, so that's a challenge that we have, and we need to be very careful about that. So that's why critical appraisal is so, so important, whether it's a single study, a systematic review, or a best practice guideline. The other situation that we can have is uh, you could have a very, very well done systematic review, um, but the, the single studies included in that systematic review are of very poor quality themselves. So again, we can have challenges there because you can't fault the review. The review's been done very well, but the evidence base is of a poor quality. And then we have the same issues then, that it would be hard to really trust then the quality um, and the findings coming out of that review if the evidence base is of itself poor quality. So those are both the things that we need to be um, very careful of. And if, we, if you were to find yourself in those instances, um, but still feeling you need to act, then um, you know one might proceed cautiously. It might be well, you know, we're, we don't have a lot of certainty at this point that we um, in this particular intervention, so we're not sure we should really do it. Or maybe we should pilot test something in a small way and and evaluate it ourselves and see what type uh, of response we get. So again, um, though it's a very, very important question to ask and we need to think about um, those carefully. And it, it leads to another topic that um, maybe we should do again. Uh, I'm not sure we've done this as a, a webinar on um, GRADE. If we haven't done it, then we probably should in the future. And if we have, um, perhaps go revisit that. But GRADE um, is uh, an approach that uh, guides us to take a look at all of the evidence, the quality of the evidence, the differences in the findings, many aspects to help us uh, to give a rating of how much certainty we actually have in those findings. Um, and and uh, that's something that can be very uh, helpful in terms of um, guiding us in, in whether to use those results and how much we should really um, believe in the, the results. Um, okay, now if I just move on, what if you cannot find an appropriate tool for the type of study design? Um, that is, CAS does not have the tool to critically appraise the study design for the single study you are looking at. Um, example, measuring chemicals produced in smoke using 
uh, smoking machines. Yes, um, very, uh, really, really good uh, question. And, and you're certainly right in that there is not yet um, critical appraisal tools of methods for every type of study design and for all the different kinds of questions uh, that are out there. Sometimes we might be able to borrow, I say in quotation, some of the criteria that might exist in other kinds of tools. So for example, um, I don't know if for this, in this particular example you've given, but um, would, you know, are any of the criteria that might exist for diagnostic studies um, helpful at all, or could they be modified or tweaked? Um, could be something uh, that you could look at. Um, I'm always, uh, you know, very supportive in um, being proactive. So um, whether or not CAF has the ability to take requests, I, I, I don't know, but I always think it would be important to connect with that group, uh, any of us that are in the, in the world of creating tools, um, may, you know, kind of making them aware that, um, there's a there's a, an appraisal tool that's needed for a design that isn't yet on their stu and on their site and is this something they might be interested in like so th that I would always encourage that reaching out um, because you know you you never know if they uh, hear from a certain number of people about a particular type of tool that might be the justification they need to uh, allocate resources to start working. Um, on a tool like that. So really getting your requests in to those that create tools and then um, taking a look at existing tools to see if there's anything that could be modified and tweaked to meet those uh, particular needs of different kinds of questions. And then the last question that I'm seeing right now is, um, do you have any recommendations on how best to report quality appraisal results? Um, should they even be reported in a rapid review? Um, actually, yes, that is an excellent question. And um, if that isn't in the rapid review guidebook, I'm going to have to go back in and make a few changes to that. So, yes, when you're writing up a report, um, you know, there's a couple of different things that you can do. One, in a, in a paragraph format, you're going to want to give a description. So you're going to want to say we found this many uh, studies and um, after we you know, assessed for relevance or inclusion and exclusion, this many um, articles remained. And um, after uh, critically appraising them, um, this many were, you know, the, uh, we want to give some description of that quality of the evidence. We might want to, we could give an overall, many of them, um, generally, the body of evidence was very well done, and here's a few areas that there tended to be limitations, or overall, the literature was really quite poor with respect to A, B, and C. Um, so you want, you, you want to be able to give a description in a text format of really what did the literature look like with respect to quality, and what are some specific areas that maybe they were um, really good at or perhaps has, um, you know, we're quite limited. The other thing that you can do, and um, we can um, look to post something uh, with the slides uh, in a few, uh, when we put these up, but there, you know, there's tables that I've used in my uh, systematic reviews um, where you create uh, like an Excel table that will, or sorry, just a table that will have all your studies and all of your criteria, your critical appraisal criteria, and whether it's a check mark or a yes or a no or something like that to be able to um, visually depict how each of your studies ended up being rated on all of the criteria. Um, so you'd want to, um, you want to create, you want to have those tools. Uh, you want to have um, like an, uh, an appendix like that for yourself. And that could be something that could be included formally in the report or share, you know, saved um, in a file format uh, knowing that that's been um, cited uh, in your report so you know where to go back to look at it if you needed to. 
So we have a couple of different examples. I'm sure it'd be easy for us to um, post one with the with the slides. Um, so I see we're very quickly running out of time. I see there's one more question. I'll try to do my best. Um, health units throughout Ontario are often asking themselves the exact same high-level questions and may therefore embark on the development of the exact same review. Um, what are your suggestions for having other organizations do this type of review or sharing reviews done by public health units so others, um, you know, can access them and not have to do all their own? I, I'm definitely um, a strong, strong advocate of sharing as much as as much as we can. Um, I'm I'm really not kidding when I say we've. Um, you know, over the course of all the years that uh, we've worked with public health, um, you know, I'll be I'll be doing a workshop with uh, you know a health unit at one end of the country and just kind of off the cuff, give an example of um, something that another health unit is working on uh, and that they're you know doing a review on X. And I think almost every time I've said something like that, someone in the audience will say, "Oh, oh my goodness, we." we're doing that too, or we just made a decision to do that, and we always try to put them in touch with each other so that they can share it. Um, the, so I, I really firmly believe that we want to share that. We, the, the, the synthesis part, the, you know, at a minimum, the identification of, I mean, if the questions are similar enough, the search results, um, and the studies that were found to be relevant, um, sharing of um, the if critical appraisal was done by that organization, and then data extraction. Um, you know, even if it wasn't the full report, if people didn't feel comfortable sharing that, but it was this other underlying knowledge, that that's probably 60% of the work right there. So I do think it is really, really important to be able to share whether that's thinking about some kind of a central place that these things could be um, put. And I know that there's been some discussion certainly in Ontario about that. Uh, you know, um, you know, one folks shouldn't forget that there's healthevidence.ca, which is a repository of systematic reviews, published systematic reviews, but you know, within that template, within that website, there's likely, you know, definitely opportunities to find a place for these uh, health unit developed um, rapid reviews. So certainly we need to keep discussing how can we share them, um, how can we make it easier for people to know uh, what others have worked on, and not just in Ontario, but really uh, across the entire uh, country. So um, I'm going to let you take the presentation back, Olivia. That's great. Thanks, Maureen, for uh, going through all those questions and a great presentation. Um, so for those who are still in the session, we just have a few more polling questions that we would love uh, to get your feedback on. So we're wondering, now that we've gone through the presentation, um, if you could rate um, the helpfulness of rapid reviews in informing program planning decisions. Um, so, similar question to earlier, and just again, um, select your responses and remember to click submit at the bottom uh, of the screen. So, thank you to those who are uh, responding. We'll leave that open for just a little bit longer. And uh, we've gone through most of our uh, questions or comments, although you can continue to share any questions or comments that you have, um, and we can try to respond to those via email as well, if that's helpful. Um, and then we'll just close up that polling question and open up our next one. Um, so we're wondering if this uh, method or tool could be useful to you in practice. Um, and we'll open that. Perfect. Uh, Grace has that open up, which is great. Um, and we'll just let that polling question run um, and in the meantime, uh, we'll flip to the next slide. And uh, your feedback is really important to us. So we ask that if you can just take a few moments um, after the session to share your thoughts on today's webinar. So we really use um, all of the comments and suggestions to improve on the resources, uh, the webinars that we offer, and the topics um, that, or the methods or tools that we select for all of our sessions. 
So we have the link to the survey in the PowerPoint uh, presentation, and we'll post that in the chat section as well. Um, and just our final polling question of the day, so we're wondering just what your next steps are. So for those of you um, who have heard about the Rapid uh, Review Guidebook, we're wondering if you have um, any actions up next. So it could be accessing the method or tool referenced uh, today, um, reading the NCCMT summary uh, about the method or tool, and note that there's actually also a dedicated web page on the NCCMT um, website for this uh, guidebook. Um, you may consider using the method or tool in practice or sharing it with a, a colleague. So you can select multiple responses for this. Um, and I just see one question in the chat section um, asking if we'll have access to the recording. Um, we will. We will be sharing the audio recording and the PowerPoint presentation um, through our website, and I'll post a link to that as well. And um, actually, just following up to a comment uh, that Maureen had made about uh, grade, we're actually going to be featuring uh, the grade um, appraisal uh, approach in our next Spotlight webinar series. So that'll be on March 22nd uh, from 1 to 2.30 uh, Eastern time, and uh, uh, Gordon Guy will actually be presenting uh, during that session. So we're really looking forward to that. So it'd be a great compliment to uh, our webinar today. Um, so we also invite you to share your story. So if you're using EIDM in your practice, we'd love to hear. Um, or if you need any support for EIDM, uh, feel free to contact us for any help, and we have our email um, posted there on the slide and in the chat section. Um, so I think that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much to those who have stayed a little bit later. We really appreciate um, everyone's engagement and all of their questions today, really created for a rich discussion, and it's great to hear everybody's comments. So I'll leave it to you, Maureen, if you have any final comments that you wanted to leave today. Just uh, thanks, everyone, for um, joining us today. It was a pleasure to talk to you about the Rapid Review Guide, and we look forward to hearing from you if you're using it and you have any comments or tweaks or want to tell us about the, about the experience of using the guidebook and creating rapid reviews. We'd love to hear them. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Have a great afternoon.